Everyone, this is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee. I'm here today with uh, another episode of Plant Free MD, and I have a special guest today, uh, Nathan, who is a uh, personal trainer and a nutrition coach and has had a very interesting personal story and relationship with his uh, health and mental well-being as well uh, uh, on, a di- on a keto and then carnivore diet. Nathan, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Um, well, wh- why don't you start by just, just telling us a bit about yourself and telling us your story and the things that you had to sort of go through and, and uh, the benefits you found through nutrition. Yeah, so I, um, I I started all of this. Uh, I guess it's close to close to ten years now is when I first uh, started with keto and kind of actually actually learning about health. My my family was always um, well. My dad was never healthy, <laughs> and my uh, my mom uh, always tried to be healthy, but she had she's she's very old fashioned, and she read all of the typical you know lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And, uh, and that's what she read all of those books. So she was convinced that, you know, that's the way to go. So that's how she raised, uh, my brother and I. Um, and so I just always assumed that low fat, more plants, less meat was always a good thing. Um, fortunately I was never able to give up meat. (laughs) So I think that's the only reason I didn't go way off the rails, but yeah. So about, uh, well, I, I had a, I've had a seizure disorder. Um, it cropped up probably about sixth grade, I think, um, somewhere around 11 ish years old it was the first time I, I noticed auras is what I would get. Um, they were very few and far between when I was younger. Um, but then as the older I got, the more frequent they became and the more debilitating they became until they eventually, when I was in college, led to a grand mal seizure and almost killed me. Um, in about in 2010, I believe that was, okay. uh, and that was when I was first started on a slew of different medications. They had, I mean, they were all kind of anti seizure meds. Some of them were also doubled as antipsychotics. You know, I had De- Keppra, Depakote, Seroquel, Lamictal, all the, all that crap. Um, none of them ever worked. Uh, they sometimes kind of controlled the auras, but they still never stopped them from happening. Um, and even then the longer I was on the medication, the less and less they seemed to control them. And the worse my other symptoms started getting where I started feeling like an Alzheimer's patient. I, uh, I was still in college. I was trying to graduate, uh, my undergrad with a psychology and philosophy degree. Um, and so I was really struggling mentally and it was making me depressed i I couldn't think straight it was awful um and so i was fortunate enough uh to meet a buddy who referred me to his doctor who had been researching this great doctor in la Uh, i had been researching this for years um and so he said why have none of these neurologists ever put you on a ketogenic diet that's the first thing you should do for seizures yeah Uh, I had no idea what it was. And so I tried it out and lo and behold, two months later, I'm off all of my medications. I'm completely free of seizure auras for the first time in my life. And I feel, uh, I, I actually lost, uh, 30 pounds. I, I was bodybuilding at the time. Um, and I, I was in the mentality of the, you know, have to eat every two hours for your metabolism and constantly chug down protein shakes and bars and everything. Uh, but after going keto, I, uh, I dropped 30 pounds. And then, uh, I remember I was working at a gym at the time as a assistant manager and they were, they started asking me what steroids I was taking. I was like, I I swear I'm not, I'm not taking anything guys. Like I literally just changed my diet. Nobody believed me, of course. Yeah, <laughs> um, I never do. But yeah, yeah, they never, they never do. They, they still don't. <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, so after that, uh, I was like, okay, that's that's pretty significant that these doc, you know, brilliant neurologists mm-hmm. couldn't figure any of this out. They didn't even bother trying to look into diet and this completely fixed it in two months along with also resolving my uh i had a 
fatty, a non-alcoholic fatty liver at the time. Um, cause growing up, I loved fruit. Um, and mm. as I'm sure a lot of people who follow, you know, you know, fructose goes straight to the liver. So, um, mm. yeah, just constantly having smoothies as a kid was more mm. than enough to accumulate there. And that also totally reversed. Yeah. W were you eating a lot of other exogenous sugars and added sugars? Or was it mostly just fruit? Um, I actually, I mean, I, I of course ate crappy food too. You know, I highly processed stuff, uh, but it wasn't, I was, I was always kind of health, health conscious about it. It wasn't mm -hmm. constant, you know, donuts and cookies and ice cream and all of that. Yeah. Uh, because of how my mom brought me up, I was always trying to, okay, well, I can have those things, you know, every so often, but for the most part, I got to try to eat my, my healthy choice meals and my, you know, frozen, low fat, whatever the heck it was that I was getting from the grocery store. Um, so it was all, I mean, it was all highly processed, but it, in my mind, it was the better version of that. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it was, it sounds like, you know, less, less sugar added sort of things. The only reason I ask is because, you know, some, some people try to argue that, you know, the, the fructose and fruit won't affect you the same way. And, uh, and of course it will, you know, I mean, you'll get a bit less of it because there's, there's fiber in fruit, but certainly the fruit juice is like that fructose is fructose is fructose. And if that, if that is getting in your system, it will act the same in your system. And so that's, that's a good, you know, uh, you know, firsthand illustration that uh, you can certainly run into problems, and even at a, at a quite a young age too, getting getting uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver, what I call it, fructose fatty liver disease, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to derail you there, but yeah, just no, 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 but, uh, no, you're, you're fine. Yeah, and it, that's a perfect point. And I mean, I was only, and I was never the, the reason. Part of the reason that the neurologist looked into diet was because I've I've never been overweight. I never looked like I was unhealthy. I was a skateboarder for 16 years. I was always lean. Um, I had uh, I had started working out in high school, so I started building muscle then. So I always kind of looked like I was in shape. But uh, that's the big misconception that yeah. doctors tend to have, unfortunately, is that just because yeah. you look okay doesn't mean you are. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So after uh after cutting all that out and starting to feel so much better i i started looking into diet and researching into it a lot more um and even during that time that i was keto although it helped me recover from a lot of a lot of that stuff um i was still very very much food addicted uh, i think a big part of that was from uh the fact that I, I went into that bodybuilder atmosphere and I, I basically gave myself, you know, orthorexia and a food addiction from that constantly tracking every single, you know, macro and micro and calorie yeah. and all of that. Um, and it was, it was years, uh, struggling with the food addiction. I would, um, again, still doing the bodybuilding. I would have my weekly or, bi-weekly cheat meals where I would let myself just go crazy on donuts and candy and ice cream and whatever I wanted. Um, and of course I would always feel miserable afterwards, yeah. uh, which after doing keto that, that was kind of like my, my saving grace there. Cause it, it made me feel so good that once I binged on those other things, after enough times doing that, I started to kind of really want or why the hell I was doing it to begin with because I felt so terrible when yeah. I did it every time. Um, so that's what finally led me down the road of, well, what happens if I just stop doing that? And what if I, what if I just start trying to get the things, only the things that are actually nourishing me and nourishing me the most? Um, and that's when I start, I stumbled across people like, uh, uh, Dr. Sean Baker and um, Amber O'Hearn um, and uh, like Dr. Zofia Clemens and mm -hmm. Karen Zinn, a lot, a lot of those sorts of people. I, I don't think Karen Zinn's too much on the carnivore side, but um, that was where I started. I, I started watching some of their symposia and their presentations 
and um, and Sean Baker was a was a big one for me because I'm like, okay, well, this guy's in his 50s. He's got powerlifting world records. He's got rowing world records. Mm-hmm. He looks jacked. He's like six five and 240 pounds, yeah. and he still has abs. And then he posts videos yeah. of himself eating five pounds of steak and no bloating at all. I'm like, okay, this yeah. is, there's something to this. Um, so that's when I first started experimenting with a full, full carnivore. Um, and I was also doing one meal, at a, uh, one meal a day at the time, just because, uh, I was trying to support a business and, and really, really struggling financially. So I couldn't actually mm-hmm. afford to eat more than that. In fact, I even, I even ended up doing, uh, three meals a week for a little while where oh, wow. I, I would have one meal on Monday or no, it was one meal on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it was four meals a week oh, and wow. I wouldn't eat anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was about all I, I, all I could afford for a, a good few months there. Um, yes. I was trying to help a, help a gym get off the ground and that, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that was a tough time, but <laughs> oh, yeah. But it, it, it got me through, you know, I, uh, the only things I was able to afford at that time were ground beef and eggs. Uh, you know, I got a pack of 60 eggs for five bucks and a uh, tube of 10 pounds of ground beef for 20 bucks. Um, Not bad. Yeah. 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 So 25, 25 bucks a week fed me, uh, fed me pretty well. Um, that's yeah. why I was able to handle it despite working like 19 hour days, six, seven days a week. Um, but that that experience kind of made me realize a couple of things. Number one, okay, there's something really powerful to this diet because if I was not doing this, I would very very likely be either insane or dead right now. <laughs> um, yeah. And and I was still during this entire time, I was still able not only to work out, um, but to do incredibly intensive workouts. And um, and that's when I first started competing in powerlifting and. Uh, my, uh, well, technically my, my very first competition would have set a bunch of state records, but I didn't realize that it was a, it was not a drug tested competition until afterwards. Um, and then after that, my, my next competition was like a few months after that. And I I broke all the state records in the drug tested category. Um, and then I've done that three other times since then, uh, each time I've competed, uh, and the, the, the biggest change for me though, was really in, in the last, about in the last year, um, when I finally made the commitment to say, okay, I'm just swearing off all, all plants, all sweets. Um, cause I, even, even starting carnivore, I, I still had that sweet tooth. I would still struggle with, um, I mean, I knew I couldn't do any of the, you know, processed crap, but I would sometimes get some monk fruit sweetener and make my own little fat bombs or whatever it was, um, and pretend that they were healthy. <laughs> um, but it was, it was keeping my addiction going. And so this last year or so, um, was my, the first time that I have ever in my life had true fruit, free, true food freedom, excuse me. Um, and so now I'm every day is, uh, I, I go to the butcher. I, I just started loving beef bacon, uh, beef belly. It's nice. Delicious. So yeah. I, I mean, I season everything exclusively with salt. Now I have about two ounces of liver a day. Um, I, I have 10, 12 ounces of bone broth every day. Uh, usually one, maybe two meals each day, just cause that's all I really feel that I need. Yeah. Uh, I don't get hungry outside of that. And, uh, and the, the biggest thing though, is, is conquering that food addiction, which was lifelong. And of course, resolving a, a seizure disorder that supposedly couldn't be cured. Um, and, and then also all of my mental health issues that I struggled with from being insecure, uh, having tremendous anxiety and depression, um, partly from the drugs that I was on from this, for the seizures, partly from just life stressors, um, working 19 hours, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, but it's, 
it, it's truly incredible. And I, I really cannot understate, or I guess I can't overstate the, uh, the value of, of what eating just meat, salt, and water has, has done for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's, and that's a, a fantastic shortage to come through. And I, I think that that's um, really important to bring up the seizure, seizure issue, because that, that's something that, you know, like you say, you know, you, you met this doctor and you said, why haven't they not tried you on a ketogenic diet? That should be the first thing they do. And I, and I agree. Why would you, why would you just jump straight into uh, medication? Some people say, well, you know, it's really difficult to control what someone eats, but if I give them this pill, it's, that's easier to manage. Um, seems kind of lazy to me, you know, and it's just like, you know, if, if, if you find that you're having that difficulty with a patient, then, you know, sure, you know, go to plan B, but um, you can, you can at least try that. And, and I think the problem is because we've focused so much on the pharmac uh, uh, pharmacogenetic sort of uh, uh, treatments of, of these sorts of um, issues, we've actually forgotten that we've been using a ketogenic diet for nearly a hundred years uh, to treat epilepsy and intractable epilepsy. Um, there are certain kinds of epilepsy that don't seem to be as responsive uh, to ketogenic uh, diet. However, you know, those are the ones you can target with medication and, and or surgery, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if you had it. Do you have a, a, a diagnosis on what type of epilepsy that you had? Um, they never actually gave they, the, the official diagnosis was an undiagnosed seizure disorder. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, from, from the literature, you know, it, it does seem to suggest if you, if you have sort of, you know, focal area of, of like temporal lobe epilepsy, that this isn't uh, as, uh, you, know, ben, you know, ketogenic diet wouldn't be as successful with that. Uh, I haven't seen it one way or the other uh, with patients, you know, uh, but um, I haven't, I haven't specifically, uh, you know, because I, I don't treat seizures specifically, that would be neurology side of thing, you know, by the time we get to them, or they come to us, you know, we're doing, uh, you know, they've, they've tried sort of everything and thrown the kitchen sink at it, they hopefully have tried diet. And if, um, if there's a focus, then, you know, we would be looking to resect that focus from from generally the temporal lobe. And so that's when, when by the time I see them, uh, they're already at that, that stage of like, this is sort of their last port of call. But um, it's, it is something that I think a lot of people have, for, have for just forgotten or maybe not even learned in the first place, but it's absolutely in the literature. Johns Hopkins still uses it today. Uh, from what I know, I, I read a paper from uh, them, a departmental paper uh, that they put out a couple of years ago talking about, hey, this has been going on for a long time and yeah, we still do it. And here's a you know case study with 60 people on it and it showed very good results, you know? And, um, you know, uh, I think, uh, there was that, what was that uh, documentary? Uh, um, it was, yeah, it was fat, a documentary uh, by oh, Vinny yeah, yeah, No, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and you know, obviously he did you know, one and two, and then he's done Beyond Impossible, which is also fantastic. And, and in those, he, uh, one, one of the stories he talks about is, is a Hollywood producer, I forget the guy's name, but his son had really bad epilepsy, he was on tons of medication, had gone through surgery, surgeries didn't go so well, had complications thereof. And then all of a sudden someone mentioned keto and it's just gone. No. Oh problem. yeah. I think it was uh, JJ Abrams. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah. Okay. That sounds, that sounds right. Yeah. And uh, you know, and, and that's the thing. It's just like, these are, these are obviously this guy is not shy on cash. He's going to be going to some of the best people in the world. Uh, you know, especially in, you know, the LA area, you're, you're going to have fantastic institutions and fantastic doctors. And yet, you know, we, we've just been so focused on treating these things with drugs that, you know, just don't even think about these things anymore. Maybe it's just like, oh yeah, that's sort of an antiquated way of doing this, but the real treatment is the medication where really, if this is, if this is helping, if the dietary changes are helping, you're actually addressing the underlying condition as opposed to just, you know, putting a seal over it. You're actually, you know, fixing the problem. And um, so you haven't had, have you been just completely seizure free since going keto or did you have some issues? 10 years now, or, or almost, almost 10 years. I think it was 2013 that I first experienced. Yeah. So, so nine years, not a single, not even one instance of a seizure. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was, yeah. I, um, some people that I've spoken to who, who, you know, had, had very bad epilepsy, um, they found even 
even uh, some plant, but like even coffee would be a trigger for them. Like they had to be pure carnivore oh, wow. before they, they were able to get rid of seizures. And, uh, and even just, yeah, drinking a cup of coffee, bam, had a seizure. And um, yeah, or, or even taking out like, caffeine, you know? And so as they, they described it for themselves, they were like, caffeine is a neurotoxin, you know? Like this stuff, you know, kicks off seizures uh, in, in him anyway. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's incredible. What you're, you're talking about, you know, depression and anxiety. Um, this is something that, you know, we, we do hear a lot. Um, and there, and obviously there are different, different mechanistic reasons for that. Um, quite a lot of people get, get benefit just going keto and get it upping their meat and upping their fat and cholesterol. And, and you know, with our studies showing that increased cholesterol, uh, increasing your LDL cholesterol is actually protective against depression and, and suicidality. Um, but I've certainly noticed in, in a certain subset of, of patients, including myself, that even just greens, and even, even if you're on a ketogenic diet, that's great, but even like greens and, and uh, different vegetables and plants that don't contain carbohydrates, and you're still getting a lot, a lot of fat and, and cholesterol, that this can actually be, be a trigger. Jordan Peterson is a famous example of that. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't until he dropped uh, salads that, uh, that he got, got rid of his very, you know, sounded crippling depression and anxiety. Um, did, did you have a similar experience to that? I, I was fortunate, I think in, in that, um, just, just being keto resolves. So, so many things for me mm -hmm. that, um, I, I wasn't, or at least I didn't notice sensitivities for a long time. Yeah. Um, and, and I, and I was kind of going through the process of, of healing while I was doing keto, but yeah, absolutely. I will say that once I finally got rid of all of the plant products completely, um, there's a marked difference. It's something that I, I know you, you, you know, Brett, Brett Lloyd, uh, mm -hmm. um, he talks about effortless daily happiness and, um, uh, that was something that was kind of foreign to me. I've had little, I, I had had like little bursts of, oh, I feel really good right now. And I, I had kind of had that throughout my course of keto, but there was never a sustained feeling of elation, mm. I guess, um, until it was probably, it hit me like about, I want to say, 21 to 30 days into just strictly meat, salt, water. Um, that was when I had that light switch just kind of a flip in the brain where I was like, oh, that's what he's talking about with that for this daily happiness. I feel amazing all the time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was, that was kind of the end to all of the um, anxiety, depression, issues that I'd had, um, and they were slowly, they, they had been slowly on their way out. And I mean, you know, my wife was, was huge and instrumental in, in helping that as well, of course. Um, but, uh, but they, they, they were still there and able to be triggered. I think if, if a certain incident happened or if something that was particularly aggravating, occurred, I, I could see them like resurging. But now, uh, even with all the crazy stuff going on, on right now, that could very easily have triggered those things in me in the past, I'm, I'm easily able to just brush it off and say, I know I'm doing the right thing. I just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I definitely feel a lot better too. Um, you know, I, I, um, I was a pretty angry young man, you know, growing up. And I, oh, wow. I don't know, I can't, I can't blame all of that on, uh, on plants because even, you know, because I was, I was carnivore for a number of years playing rugby. And like, just because of, I had, you know, there's a lot of things going on in my childhood and, and upbringing that, what, that were not happy. Um, uh, I was, I, I was able to focus that on, on the rugby field. And that's why I, I think I had a lot of motivation and drive to, to work as hard as I did. Um, and to play as hard as I did, because obviously very, very physical, uh, you know, it's a collision sport. It's not a contact sport. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to kill people. Right. And I certainly was. Yeah. I was, yeah. Like, um, he was watching like old, old NFL films, things like with, uh, uh NFL crunch course, one of my all time favorite 
uh, films. We should watch it like before uh, games all the time just to get pumped up. And uh, they had Deacon Jones, uh, was like a Hall of Fame uh, defensive end. And, you know, he, he would say, you know, it's just like, you know, he would, you know, try to, you know, just take people's heads off. He's just like, he's like, you know, you get this body, you know, 275 pound body, you get it up to 4.5 speed, you know, you get a good angle on them. They should go to the hospital. And that's what I tried to do every time is I put them in the hospital and, you know, you come around me, I'm going to tear your damn head off. And uh, it was just, I would just get so charged. And, and then he was talking about, you know, Dick Butkus and he was saying, he's just like, now that man tried to put you in the cemetery, not the hospital. You know? yeah. and I, it just went mm-hmm. off on it, and that was that was just what I did. I just I really tried to go after it, and um, you know, and just the uh, a lot of that, a lot of sort of you know pent up anger, you know, went out onto the field. And I remember one of my teammates just looked at me and he said, "You know, there's a, there's a lot of people that play with with anger, but you just play with pure hatred, don't you?" And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I was like. Yeah, that, that's pretty accurate, you know. Um, but at the same time, when I was off the field, I was I was same as I am now, just very chilled out. Like things did not bother me, you know. I, it, some, something would have to be very serious for it to to upset me, and um, you know, I just I just wouldn't get get bothered by these things. And um, and so that was that was, you know, just thinking back on it, probably very helpful for me to get through some some of the harder times in my life. Um, that were very, very difficult. And, and, you know, God knows how, how uh, that would have affected me when I was you know, more emotionally labile uh, when, when eating plants. And I certainly notice, notice that now, I mean, things slip in, it, it affects me and it affects my mood. And obviously I'm more sensitive to it now because I've just been away from it for longer uh, and I can see the contrast, but yeah, I, I've definitely noticed a big difference. Um, I, was, I was also going to say, so obviously you you have you have some some big records in powerlifting. Um, this is something that that comes up, and I, I tell I tell people my own personal experience with athletics and and carnivorism. Uh, but it, it, I find that I have to keep sort of re, you know sort of reiterating that you don't need carbohydrates to to be a high performance athlete. And, um, it sounds like you're, you're sort of in that, that same camp. What, what has been your experience? Have you, have you, you know, felt that you, you would do better with carbs or, or how do you, how do you feel on that? So, yeah, so this, the powerlifting is, is a really interesting thing because, um, I love, I, I love powerlifting because of the atmosphere. Every, every single person there is super supportive. Everyone's there just to beat their own records. They don't care about anybody else. They just want to do better than their own best. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it's always a great atmosphere in that sense. It's also hilarious to me that um, the competitions usually last somewhere between eight and 12 hours. They're, they're very mm-hmm. long. I mean, all you're doing is squat, bench, and deadlift, um, and you only Jesus. get three attempts for each. Yeah. But uh, there's so many, you know, there's 60, 70 competitors with a lot of these and they have to switch out the weights and cycle through. So it takes a long time. Um, and so I get to see what they're all eating and it's all gummy bears and sour worms and donuts and starburst and yeah. just all kinds of crap. And cause they all think that I've got a yeah. carb load, I've got my limp, you know, my lips. And so my I, I was just very pleased that my first competition was right after that period where I had about eight weeks of doing the uh, only eating four meals a week. Um, and my first competition, I was actually 42 hours fasted when it started. Um, and I told one of the other competitors who was actually in my weight class uh, that I was doing that. And he's like, oh man, you better you better get some food in you. You're going to bonk out. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's when I hit my my highest ever squat at the time, and then, <laughs> um, and then I also broke my highest ever deadlift that same day yeah. on my fourth attempt because I my third attempt was a state record, so I got to try for a fourth, and I oh wow uh, I broke it again. Oh uh, damn, nice. Yeah, of course. Uh, like I said, I I had misinterpreted the amount of records because it was it was supposed to be a drug tested meat, um, but I guess it was not. And so it was my second meat that I actually fully broke all of the the records, but uh, nonetheless, 
uh, I just thought it was hilarious that this guy was expecting me to just collapse on the on the platform and yeah and I, when I I beat all my records um, yeah. and and I've done that every time I've competed um, nice. most most of the competitions I was somewhere between 16 and 20 hours fasted that's actually when I feel best for lifting my heaviest um, yeah. I don't I even even eating carnivore I don't actually like to ha have a, a large meal before before lifting super heavy I feel much cleaner when I'm at least 12 or 16 hours fasted uh, yeah. so yeah so I've done that for each competition and I consistently outperformed myself each time um, and yeah I, I have no need I don't feel like I need carbs there, there was one point at which I was debating like oh I wonder if maybe I just had a little bit of like fruit or something during one of the meets maybe that could give me a little boost at the end but um no I uh I really don't feel like I need it at, at most if I if I really felt like I needed an extra boost um I brought a uh, bone broth with me <laughs> and I sipped on that with a little apple cider vinegar and mm -hmm. that'll uh that and then salt of course I'll, I'll always use some salt before lifting heavy okay. um and that's that's a big big booster for me but yeah, yeah. people were looking at me like i was crazy <laughs> not yet <Yeah. eating. laughs> did that did that guy who uh commented and said you were going to pass out did he come up to you after did, did he did he recognize that uh you actually outperformed uh you know probably him and, and a lot of others obviously you set a state record so that's uh you outperformed everyone in that regard uh, every, everyone for the day. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a Nevada state record. So it's not like a N Nevada's not quite as competitive, I would say, um, as, as some other, like California's got a, a much bigger powerlifting scene. Um, yeah. so I probably couldn't compete with some of those numbers to be fair, but, uh, but yes, I, I did outperform and, uh, he, he very quickly kind of clammed up because <laughs> this is I, I was just trying to kind of meet people a little bit there and um and and actually market for the gym that I was that I was helping to to run um but yeah he, he kind of clammed up and kept his distance after after he saw me <laughs> my squat performance yeah uh, well yeah if he was smart he'd come up and talk to you and say like, okay what's your trick what's going on you know maybe there's something to this and um you know I, I guess that's that's the thing people want to be uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to have the right answer. They just want to think that they're right for some reason. I, I don't, you can get both, you know, it's like, it's, uh, you know, if you're actually right, you can also, you also get to think you're right. You know, which is fun. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. and the scary, the scary thing to me was that, um, it, it surprised me that, that none of, uh, none of these guys saw their future. So that's, all, all of the judges and uh, and a lot of like the meat directors and everything, a lot of them are former, you know, world record 800, 900 pound lifters who were gods in their day. Every single one of them is morbidly obese now. You know, uh, I mean, all, all complete respect for the guys that, and, and, and yeah. girls that do that. And they're, they're incredibly impressive, but, but, you know, some of them couldn't stand up the entire day because yeah. they have trouble literally standing yeah, because of sad. how much weight they've gained because they they never stopped eating like power lifters even when they stopped power lifting you know yeah, just kept it's eating crazy the, the gummy bears and donuts you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly you know i um you know to, to your point of, of playing fasting i always found that i perform better uh, on an empty stomach always i would never eat the day of, of a game or a match you know even, even when i was i was wrestling um, maybe I'd eat breakfast. I'd always feel like shit if I did. And so mm -hmm. I would, I would always, you know, even if it's like, you know, you are 16 hours and you're, you're wrestling six matches throughout the day. Like I would just, I wouldn't eat the entire day. And there's a lot of all these other people just eating and eating and eating. And I just found that, that I just felt way better when I didn't do that. And certainly with rugby, I just never, I, you know, I often wouldn't eat the, the night before I often, uh, didn't oh. like eating dinner like maybe i'd have something during the day but i often i was getting sort of later at night i'm like ooh, i don't know if i i don't know if i want to eat this close to a match and i would uh yeah so i would be 
you know, sort of, yeah, 16, 24 hours fasted most games that I played. And I wouldn't, yeah, I would never take in sugar or anything like that. And I would always feel much, much better for it. And the times that I broke away from that, I've always regretted it. Every single time I've regretted it. Um, I was talking to, um, uh, to, to Dr. John uh, uh, Jake Wish, who did the, the X3 bar. I don't know if you've seen that, but like the, right. the rubber band yeah, thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was saying that there were, there were studies showing that to replenish your, your liver's glycogen, you, you really only need 20 grams of carbs and like, and, and you, or, or your muscle glycogen is like, you, you'll replenish your, your muscle glycogen, I should say, uh, with just 20 grams, you know? So these people just, just, just taking in just tons and tons and tons of carbs and sugar. It's, it's just complete overkill. You don't need that. And so, and I'm sure that's in the, in the context of a, of a mixed diet already, you know, because like, if you're, you know, you're, you're just going to deplete your glycogen more easily on a, on a standard, well, well, when you're just eating carbohydrates, period, you know, right. because you, you, when you're on a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet, just metabolically, your body is constantly replenishing your glycogen. Like you'll use your muscle and liver glycogen and then you'll, you'll fill it back up right away, given, given a bit of rest. And um, I don't know when you sort of get into your, your lifting program, but like for me, I've noticed uh, on carnivore, I, I just don't wear out. You know, I mean, I can, I can force myself to, if I like, just don't give myself rest. I sort of started doing like the, the Serge Nubre sort of a approach, you know, where he just does like just 30 seconds rest in between sets. And he's just doing like 12 sets of 12 and he's just, just trying to kill himself. And then just like, a, you know, 60 second rest uh, on uh, when he's doing legs. Um, and I can, you know, I can, I can, you know, obviously I'm going to have sort of diminishing uh, you know, reps and, uh, after that. But I find that if I, if I do give myself adequate rest in between sets, you know, like, you know, a couple minutes or something like that to where, you know, I feel ready to go again, I can just keep going. Like I can just, I can just do as many sets as I want. The, the one time I really put that to the test was, was probably two weeks into being on carnivore this last time, like sort of five years ago. And I just, I, you know, I just wasn't getting sore. And I was just like, well, why, why is that? Am I just, you know, just working out like a little bitch or something. And I'm just not pushing myself or like what, because, you know, I just been, you know, in, you know, in uh, the refugee camps in Bangladesh, you know, doing humanitarian work for a few months, I had not seen a gym in months. And so, you know, and I did a heavy leg day. I did a very heavy leg day that I would have done, you know, during my professional uh, career where it was like, you know, like 12 sets of very heavy legs doing different things. And I just wasn't sore, you know, and I was just like, hmm. well, I was like, well, I didn't really wear myself out. I wasn't like really, you know, jello legged at the end of it. So, you know, maybe I just didn't, didn't push myself hard enough. And so I did the same circuit the next time around, you know, a few days and I did those sets, those 12 uh, sets. And then I just said, okay, I'm just going to keep doing squats until I just wear myself out. And uh, I just started doing squats. I gave myself a rest. I, I, I rested for a few minutes and, you know, I'm, made you know when i was ready to go again i went uh and i was just listening to a, a thomas Sowell book um i would think i think it was wealth poverty and politics great book highly recommend it yeah. and um and i and i was just did i just did set after set after set after set after set i i did another 20 sets of squats oh my god yeah and i <laughs> and and i i just came to the realization like i could i can literally keep doing this the whole night whole night like my legs are fine as long as i give myself a few minutes rest you know, I mean, sure. If I, if I just, I'm not resting. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, you'll run out. Um, mm -hmm. but I could then rest and just do it all over again. Um, you know, so, and I, and I was, you know, on the first set, I did 15 reps on the last set. I did 13 reps, you know? And mm -hmm. so it was like, it really wasn't much of a, of a, of a decline. And, wow. but I just sort of looked at it. And I was just like, well, you know, I'll just call it here because, you know, I've, you know, I've been here for four hours and I've got shit to do, <laughs> you know? And so, I sort of capped it there, but, you know, I, I, you know, since then, you know, I was, I was, um, you know, just sort of, sort of lifting and playing rugby. And, uh, I, I just, I capped myself at 20, 20 sets. And, and so I was just doing 20 sets of bench, 20 sets of, sh of shoulders, 20 sets of, of, um, you know, dips, 20 sets of squats, 20 sets of deadlift. And I just, this is what I did. <laughs> and so, oh. and I just, you know, just, just beasted out, but, um, you know, I had three, four hours, a day to work out at that point, because I was, I wasn't, um, you know, constantly, I wasn't doing 130 hour weeks at the hospital. Um, what about you? How do you, how do you notice your, 
your workouts being affected? What's your, what's your routine at the moment? So that, that was another, I, I, uh, I also played around with how much, how much can I handle? Because mm -hmm. it was incredible what a difference it was. I, I remember even, um, before, before my, my first powerlifting competition, I wasn't, you know, I was still kind of on and off experimenting with carnivore, but not really. Um, and I would, I, I, I think I was still having a cheat meal every so often then um, of, of actual regular sugar sometimes. Um, usually I would try to make the cheat meal more like a, a keto cheat meal, but mm -hmm. even then it would still devolve sometimes. But uh, I remember when I was doing that, um, if I did a max squat bench and deadlift all in one day, I was toast for multiple days. Like I would have to kind of slowly recover and try to recap all of that um and just recently i i started just because i i had so much energy i just started adding onto it so like i've had days now where i maxed my squat bench and deadlift in like 20 minutes and they were new maxes that i'd never hit before brand new um and then i kept going and i, I was like okay what else can i max and so i did some barbell hack squat maxes that matched my deadlift. Um, I did sumo deadlifts. I did trap bar deadlift max. I did a uh, overhead press max, uh, barbell row max. Um, and then I still wasn't satisfied. So I, I even did some, uh, just to, just to try it, uh, some bicep curl barbell max and, uh, skull crusher barbell max. And then I even, um, I have a, client who's, uh, she's already broken all of her own world records in powerlifting. And so she got bored with it. And so, so now she wants to learn the Olympic lifts and break records there too. So I've been learning the Olympic lifts with her. And so after the biceps and triceps, I was like, okay, well, let's see, let's see about my Olympic lift max. And, uh, and then I broke my snatch and my clean and jerk maxes all. And so that was like 10 different maxes in one day. Um, yeah. And I, I was at, by the, the, the most amazing part was by the end of it, I still felt like I could have kept going. Like I could have yeah. just found more exercises to max on. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and I, the funniest thing to me was that I, I posted this, uh, and I, I had posted it on like TikTok or something. And somebody commented like, well, those aren't your true maxes. Like, right. well, yeah. I mean, I've never done them before. Like maybe, maybe if I did them separately, I could have done five more pounds on each of them who knows but like gotta admit 10 different maxes in a span of 90 minutes that's not something that that somebody who's not on carnivore could do i think no i don't i don't think so yeah and uh and that's it's just the thing like it, it's it's really next level stuff here like it's not it's not small difference it is a yeah. massive 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 difference and then after that you know let me ask you were you sore the next day or two days after no, not I mean, at all. I, I right. woke up the very next day and lifted again. Totally fine. You, you should have been crippled, you know? <laughs> you know, most people would be crippled. And, you know, I, and certainly, you know, that that 12 uh, set circuit that I did on legs, the, I learned that circuit from uh, some, some of the linemen at, at the University of Washington that I was lifting with, um, you know, years and years ago. And, uh, and I, I lifted with these guys and they were big dudes. They were like twice my size and they'd been doing this, this circuit for a long time. It was a very, very heavy, uh, intensive circuit. And I hadn't really been working out that much at that time, but I was actually in shape. I'd been running a lot and, and doing a lot of sprint work. So my legs were strong. And, and so I was able to keep up with these guys and I just really you know, pushed myself. And, uh, I was, I was crippled for two damn weeks. It was two weeks I was wow. just, I could not walk. I was absolutely in agony. And I lived on the second uh, story. Thank God I didn't live higher than that uh, the place I was living in college. And uh, it was absolute agony getting up and down those stairs. It, it, it would take me, you know, several minutes to just, just eke my way up this flight of stairs. And I was just in so much pain all the time. It was two damn weeks. And I was walking so slow and deliberately. And, um, and I remember... I, and then when I came back from, from Bangladesh, I did that same damn workout. And so I was really expecting myself to be, you know, just buggered from that. And I, you know, I wasn't, and that's why I was like, Hmm, all right, well, you know, I didn't feel as 
whole, you know, just as, as, as wiped out as I normally do. So, you know, that's why, that's why I went and took it to my stable, but like, you know, that, that, that was the thing. I wasn't sore after that either. And, and a friend of mine called me the night that I did it was 32 sets. Uh, and they were like, Hey, you know, we should go, you know, hike up, you know, Mount Sidemore, which is a, you know, mountain in, in uh, uh, Washington state outside of Seattle. And it's, it's like a good, you know, three plus hour hike, just straight up. And uh, it's just switchbacks, just the whole way up. It's just four and a half miles of switchbacks. It's miserable. It's an awful hike, you know, but it's uh, it's a good workout and you get a good view at the top. And, um, and uh, they're like, Hey, you know, we should do that tomorrow. And I'm like, easy. You know, I, I, I may have just done something very stupid and uh, <laughs> I may, I may not be walking for the next couple of weeks. Let's just see how I feel in the morning. Next morning I was fine. You know, I, I felt like I could do it again. I was walking up the stairs. I didn't feel like I'd done anything. I started taking the steps two at a time and, you know, I sort of feel my hand like, yeah, okay. Yeah. There's, you know, something happened there. You know, I can, you know, they're, they're, they're not sure, but there was, there was a difference, you know, it was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, some, some work had been done. I was like, great, let's go hiking. Hiked up this big ass mountain, you know, came down, you know, it was like this, you know, you know, long several hour hike up and down. And I was like, I feel great. It's time to go back to rugby, you know? Wow. And I, yeah. And I, and I went that, that night to the, um, you know, my team, which is the Seattle Saracens as now, uh, uh, part of the, the major league rugby, uh, with the Seattle Seawolves. It's all sort of, uh, same, same organization. And so I went, went to train with, with the, the Seawolves and the Saracens that night. And I was just, you know, I hadn't trained in months and months and months, and I hadn't really played the season before. So it's not like I was in shape before I went to Bangladesh. And I was, I was, you know, I was, I did not look in shape because I was not, but I was at a dead sprint the whole time. And I was able to, I was able to keep up with these guys who had been training, training for months and I felt great. And, uh, and the next day I still wasn't sore the day after that. I still wasn't sore. I could tell my, my hamstrings were something like, like, yeah, you know, you know, there's some, some healing to do done a lot of work, but you could do it again, but eventually you're going to tear something. That was, that was sort of the, the impression that I got. And, um, two days after that, I, I went, I met a friend at Starbucks and we we're just sort of catching up since I got back in town. And, um, I was just like, all right, well, let's see, let's see what coffee does to me. You know, let's see if I can have coffee. I had one cup of black coffee and within 20 minutes, my hamstrings were sore. My back was stiff. I'm going, Oh, I, I could actually feel it stiffening up in real time. And I was just going, oh, what's happening? Ooh, what's going on? Is that, am I just imagining that? And it's just getting a little worse and a little worse. And, and eventually I'm just like stiff and sore. And, and that stayed with me for two days after that. And so, you know, that's why when people say, it's like, oh, what about coffee? I'm like, I don't touch it. You know, like that's not, that's not anything I want, you know? And, um, you know, but, but that's the thing. People don't get this. I mean, this is, this is just an insane uh, hack you know, and like, but it should just be normal life, you know, yeah. but, but people think that just being sore and miserable and, and taking, you know, several days to recover or longer is normal. It's not normal. Um, I, you can push yourself. There are, there are limits, but man, are they so much further than, than people would believe. Like I, I just stopped, I just stopped having rest days. <laughs> So I just started, I started doing like the 20 sets of everything, just back to back to back to back to back to back to back. After a couple of weeks of that, I went down to do the bench and I'd been doing 20 sets of bench like every goddamn day. Oh my and God. I sat down and I go on all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, oh, that hurts. Oh, what the hell's yeah. going on there? I just, you know, I just had, it was developing like, you know, tendonitis, you know, and uh, in my pec. And it was just like, oh, that, that's going to stop. And so, you know, eventually you can just, you can just injure yourself but I was never sore like you would get after working out. And, and so I had to sort of, you know, take it, take it a bit easier from there. I'm like, okay, all right. So I'll, I'll do sort of like my three day circuit, have a day of rest and then do the three day circuit after that. But whereas before I was, I was just going straight through, I was not taking any days of rest. Um, and I was basically doing like the same workout every other day, sometimes every day and, and to a high level. And it just, eventually that was, that caught up to me, but um, yeah. You know, so uh, there is a limit, but like normal human beings and even professional athletes would be very hard pressed to get there. You know, if you've got four hours a day just to lift like an idiot and, um, you know, and just and do it like an idiot where you're just you're not giving your body any chance to recover. Eventually, you'll, you'll hit a limit. And, and, and that's basically it, you know, that I've found. 
you know, uh, you know, barring, you know, doing something inappropriate and like, you know, injuring yourself, you know, which actually, actually just wearing out the muscle, it's very difficult. Um, yeah. So have other people in your gym started taking this up? Obviously they, they can see that you're, 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 you're cracking, you know, personal bests, you know, 10 times a day and, yeah. um, you know, and then, and then back in the gym the next day, you know, they must be taking notice of that. Yeah, it's actually really cool. I, uh, <clears throat> so I, I mean, I, I train, uh, I, I train my clients out of, out of the gym that I go to. I'm a, I, I, I pay rent to the gym. Um, and I kind of work there as a contractor. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I can't, I can't necessarily say that it was uh, <clears throat> directly from my influence, but the owner himself ended up uh, trying out an animal-based diet back in October of, of this last year, and and he's uh, he's gone wild with it now. He's he's eating liver and he's doing all this kind of stuff because he just it made him feel so amazing. Um, and I I hope that that I played a part in that. I mean, he didn't specifically mention that. He just told me that, uh, that he was, he's, he's heard all of this hubbub about, about this animal based thing. So I'm going to try it out for a month and we'll see what happens. But yeah, he's a, he's a big believer now. And, uh, I, I got a couple of people coming up to me. Uh, one was really cool is a guy who I would always see in the gym every single day. Uh, great guy. I totally thought he was in his, like, I don't know, 40, late, late thirties, early forties, maybe, uh, mid fifties, apparently. And, um, and he, he was telling me that, oh yeah, man, I, I, I love seeing your stuff. Like I've been carnivore for 20 years now. Like it's, it's the life, it's the way to go. Yeah. Um, and he, he's always been the guy who he was always in the gym first thing in the morning. He was the most friendly guy. He always said, Hey, hi, and always knew every single person in the gym had so much energy. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was really cool to just see that. And I was like, Oh, of all the people that were going to turn out to be carnivores, the guy with the most energy in the gym, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, yeah. And so I, I think a lot of people are, are starting to, to take notice, um, especially people that I've done powerlifting competitions with who, we're starting like one one guy was even asking me like man i i max out my squat and i'm done for for a couple of days like how the hell do you handle doing seven nine ten different maxes in a day I was like, yeah hey, eat meat drink water <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> don't don't be a little bitch yeah <laughs> yeah um, you, you did mention something that, that I found interesting. You said you, you take salt before you do a heavy lift. Have you, um, what's the, what's the idea behind that? And, um, and, and what have you noticed? Have you, have you done you know, with and without and, and, and what have you noticed? So I don't, I don't always do it. Um, I, I do it when I've had, a, a longer than typical fast. And if I really, like, I know I'm going to be really trying to push uh, push myself. Um, and I want to have that little extra kind of umph. The reason I started doing it, uh, was a couple of things. Number one, uh, the sodium is a, a natural vasodilator. Um, so it's supposed to help with oxygen flow, water flow, blood flow to the muscle. Um, but I had also read, um, I'm a big fan of Dr. James DeNicola Antonio and a lot of his work. And so I had just read his book, the salt fix and, um, and the immunity fix. And that was something that he suggested. He said, you know, best pre-workout that you'll ever do is not the crap that you'll buy on the shelves. You just take some Redmond real salt down a little palm full of it and mm -hmm. drink some water and then you're good to go. And I, and I, I will say that I notice, I notice a significant difference, um, especially when I do it after being fasted for a little bit longer. Um, but even, even times when I, you know, I'm only fasted for eight or 10 hours, um, I'll still notice a difference is just, I already have a good deal of salt and electrolytes in my body. So I don't think it's as big of a difference. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's not, I mean, I used to use all the pre-workouts and all the 
crazy amounts of caffeine and everything when I was younger. And so it's not, it's not that same kind of like, I'm going to bounce off the walls and try to kill somebody maybe energy, but it's, yeah. it allows me to, to push beyond just that little extra. Um, yeah. And, and I feel so much better. I feel so much cleaner. It's not like a, that like nervous, Right, yeah. caffeine energy i used to get you know yeah yeah the tingly niacin sort of uh, uh yeah i always yeah. think that yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah that's one thing too you know people ask me about like you know bcaas uh which i actually found like when i was eating just a normal diet and competing that was that was a absolute game changer for me you know I, after like um you know obviously i'd, I'd be fasted but you know, I, I would, you know, play like a whole tr like sevens tournament or something like that. And, uh, you know, you play, you know, you know, sevens rugby, it's, you know, it's very tiring. You're just, you're just, it's, a, it's just a track meet. You're just, you're just dead sprint the whole time. And you're, you're hopefully nailing someone at the end of that sprint. And so you're putting in, you're putting in a lot of effort. Um, and I found that, you know, getting into the, into the finals, um, you know, if we, you know, if we did well, generally I played on teams that did do well. And so we would, we would be playing more games than other, other teams and, and against better competition, getting into the uh, finals, you're, you're, everyone was just pretty much just worn out at, at the end of that. You know, when I was doing that carnivore, obviously I had, I had a huge advantage and I, and I was doing that early on. Um, but, you know, since then, I, you know, I was, I was just eating more normal diet, but still, you know, 78% of my, my intake was, was still meat. I was always very, I guess they call it hyper carnivore which I think is, is a bit of a misleading term, but yeah, it's, uh, I think, I think just not eating anything except meat is hyper carnivore, but yeah, that, that's whatever people, people uh, have named it that. So, uh, that's what they're referring to. So I was, I've sort of been hyper carnivore since birth, but, um, you know, I was eating other things, uh, out of, of sufferance in some, in some instances. And, and, and I found that when I was, you know, taking some of those BCAAs right before like the final, it was like, I was like fresh as a daisy. I was just, just back to normal. Um, since going carnivore again, I've actually found the opposite. I've actually found that it, it just, it really took away from me. Um, I don't know if that's just the, certainly the artificial sweeteners can, can do things that you don't want. Um, I tried getting BCAAs without artificial sweeteners. It tasted like actually drinking vomit. And so that's not something I'll be doing again. Um, and then, you know, so I started taking like maybe the capsules with the BCAA. So I don't have to just taste that filth. Um, yeah. but I just, you know, I just didn't notice it, uh, giving me a, the same boost. In fact, uh, you know, I, I found that I actually wasn't working out as well as, as I was before, you know, did you have, what, what were your experience with, uh, that, all that? Yeah. So that, that was the really, really interesting thing for me is, you know, especially coming from a, a bodybuilding background, I, I did all my research. I did all of the supplements. I used whey protein and uh, uh, casein protein and creatine and BCAAs and uh, essential aminos. And, and I used all of it. And, and it, a lot of it did, did help, especially the, the combo that was huge for me when I was bodybuilding and, and just doing keto, but not carnivore was, um, was an amino acid complex. It, the, the one that I liked was always the optimum nutrition essential amino acids, just because they tasted good. <laughs> um, and, and they had a little bit of caffeine in there and mixing that with creatine was a huge boost for me. And it really helped my workouts. Then when I started experimenting with carnivore, I noticed taking all of those things did absolutely nothing for me. Like I could take them and, um, you know, in the, in the same amounts or even in greater amounts than, than I was before. And I was like, why is, why did this just stop working? And, yes. uh, and then the more I looked into it, I was thinking, well, I'm pretty much almost exclusively eating beef. And mm -hmm. so I'm getting crazy amounts of creatine and, uh, L-carnitine and, and all of the amino acids and everything that could have given me the energy anyway. So adding more on top, isn't really going to do anything for me, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, so now I, I it, it's, it's so nice to be free of all of those things. Cause I, there, there were times where it gave me such a boost that I was like, okay, well, I can't even do a workout unless I have my creatine and my caffeine and my aminos and my this and my that. And, 
um, yeah, now I, I, I say, God, I was probably spending five, $600 a month on supplements alone, you know, back then. Um, and it was never, I never took steroids or anything like that. It was, it was always just, you know, various protein varieties of supplements, but, um, but it it racks up a huge bill, you know, and it's, uh, that's, that was the biggest thing for me. I was like, you know, if I'm only eating meat, especially with the prices of everything going up all the time and inflation, like I'm going to get broke real quick. Um, but no, I found the opposite. I, I started saving more money than ever because I only eat once or twice a day. And, um, sure. I eat two to four pounds of meat in that time, but, um, but when that's literally the only thing you eat, you've got, you got no food waste, mm. you are full all the time. So you can regularly do 48, 72 hour fasts just because you're not hungry. Um, and yeah, I, and then I don't have to waste money on supplements and other crap that sits on a shelf for months and then gets tossed out when it expires, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the food waste thing is huge. You know, like the you know, produce doesn't, you know, fresh produce does not stay fresh very long where mm-hmm. I've got, I've got meat in there. That's it's probably been in there for two months, you know, oh, yeah. like actually, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it was, I wet age them and then I, and then I dry age them, you know, and, um, or, or dry brine them, I guess it's not, it's not the same as aging, uh, but they last, you know, they last a long time. And so, you know, I just, I just buy, a big, big stock of meat. And then, and then that's it. And obviously, you know, it's even better to, you know, try to source a cow or something like that. Then it's really cheap. I was able to get a cow uh, grass fed its whole life. And it was 10 years old, which I think is an absolute secret that people should really be aware of The older, the cow, the better, the taste and hands down. It has so much more just beefy goodness. And I think it's probably a lot more nutrients. That's where that, that taste is from. Because you're, you are, you know, that's what taste is. You're, you're, you're tasting chemicals and that, that positive taste is like, th- these are good things for you. And I noticed that I got like, I had like a New York strip, a prime New York strip from Costco, great cut of beef. And then I had uh, like the New York from this 10 year old cow, you know, and, um, and I was just like doing taste test. So the prime was very well marbled, obviously the, the grass fed one, very, very lean, you know, because that's, you know, grass fed cows are just, just lean beasts. And, um, you know, because it's, it's the carbs that make them fat and then, you know, bodybuilders and things like that. And anyone else who eats carbs, you'll also get intramuscular fat. And so maybe your muscles will look bigger. They won't be bigger and they won't be better. And so when I'm eating this and, and, you know, the fat's like very dark yellow, that's how, you know, it's actually been eating grass its its whole life and, and certainly up to the end. And I was eating the, the prime one from Costco. And I was just like, oh man, I, I just love this diet. I love eating meat. This is such a good steak. God, it's so great. And then I tried the, uh, the older cow and I was like, yeah, man, this is just so good. And it just tasted just, you know, really, really good too. And then I sort of, you know, had a couple more bites and a couple more bites and I just sort of naturally lingered on the, on the grass fed one. And then I was just like, all right, well, let's try the, the, the Costco one again. I had another bite. I could not taste it. There was, there was no flavor. There's no beefy flavor. It tasted rich because it had more fat. That was it. I, I could not taste any beef flavor. It was yeah. so overpowered by the flavor that was in, in the older cow. And I was like, right, well, that's, that's it for me then. And yeah. you know, maybe that, that doesn't appeal to a lot of people. It definitely appealed to me. I absolutely loved it. And I felt supercharged. Like I, it was like, it was like, you know, just, drinking energon cubes, you know, if it catches that reference, like, uh, <laughs> you know, he's just, he's just, he's just pure energy. You're just getting this in your body. And I just, I just felt just jacked and, uh, and, and just hyper stimulated. And I just wanted to go do things and, you know, kill more meat and eat it, you know? And, um, you know, so yeah, I, I found that that was really great. And, you know, because, because older cows are not, uh, that marketable, you know, because they're, they're you know, they're generally breeding cows or dairy cows, they're not bred for their meat. And so, uh, because they, they get a bit more tough as they get older, um, people think they like, Oh, well, you know, that's not, it's not very good. So they're just grind the whole thing up into hamburger meat, such a waste, such a waste. Uh, the hamburger meat was fantastic. It smells fresh. It's almost like, like 
it doesn't smell like grass or citrusy, but it almost smells as if it should. It almost smells like this, this bright smell like, oh, what is that? It's, it's weird. It, it has an amazing smell. And, and um, it, it just, you know, it's, if you overcooked it, I could see it getting a bit tough, you know, but when you, if you just sort of rare, medium rare, it, the, the muscle meat and the fat was perfectly fine. The gristle, the connective tissue, that, that was like, you know, whale bone. Like that was like, I don't know what happened to that, but it just turned into just, just, you know, like some sort of rock art statue. And, uh, but at the same time, it was really easy just to pick that out because you're not chewing it. You're not eating it. And you just, just take that out. And then you're just eating the fat and the meat. And so it's actually very easy, uh, to, to just get the parts that you want anyway. Um, but that was, that was it. And, um, so you get it, I, I got it for much cheaper. I, I went directly to the rancher and just said, Hey, this is what I want. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're culling uh, one of your older cows from the herd, like I, I would like it, you know, I'd like to you know get it, you know, sort of butchered normally. And so he, he did me a deal because he, he wouldn't get very good rates for it because he would just, it would just be hamburger. And so he, he sold it to me for less than he would sell, you know, uh, a one or two year old steer. Um, but more than, than he would get just for the hamburger meat. So it worked out well for both of us. It was like two bucks a pound. Oh my God. Yeah. For, for yeah. the best beef I have ever had in my entire life. Oh, I'm sold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you had to buy the whole cow, you know, right. But, you know, I was, I was happy to do that. Yeah. You get a deep freezer. You just do that. And we sort of split it up. You know, a friend of mine got a quarter, my brother got a quarter and I got a, half and and you know uh uh, you know share that with my parents uh when i left they just sort of kept it and um you know so that that was perfectly fine and yeah and you can just you just flash freeze that stuff and you've got you've got food for the next year or two you know and it's good it's really good and so you know that's what i i think now when when these these, you know craziness with the beef prices and these weird things that these, um, you know, beef manufacturing or meat manufacturing, uh, uh, places have just been had weird accidents and been destroyed. There's like 12 of them in the last, like, you know, several weeks. I don't know what that's about, but it's very strange. And then like 120,000 pounds of beef just like, just got recalled. I don't, I don't, I don't know how that works you know, for, for possible E. coli, but you know, they do these things in batches and then you, you test something from a batch and they say, okay, this batch is contaminated, bring it all back. Um, I may be wrong, but that sounds like a big batch. And, yeah. you know, and uh, so, you know, is that, is that just from one batch or was that from several batches and they just, they just pulled them all, um, you know, for, for some, some other reason because they linked it to that or something like that. I don't know, but that's a lot of meat. And, uh, you know, I, I'll cook, I'll cook it, like, just give it to me. That's fine. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, right. not, I'm not, you know, I'm not too worried about that, but, um, yeah, so that, that's, yeah, that's a great trick. You just, just get it, just get a cow and just put it in the freezer. And then you can just sort of wait out this nonsense for the next couple of years. And, True. uh, yeah. And, and sort of do that. Um, you know, what, you know, one question, uh, actually I did have just, it's sort of an aside, uh, you were talking about monk fruit sweetener. That's, that's something that I heard before. What the hell is that? Is that, is that actual like fruit sugar? Is that some sort of like artificial thing or what is that? Yeah, I guess it's the, from the, uh, what's the plant called? It's like the Lao, Lao Guan, Lao Guan plant. It, it's some, some specific, uh, plant. And I, I guess they, uh, they, they extract the sugar from it or whatever the sweet aspect of it is in the same way that they do like i think with sugarcane i don't know a whole lot about it but it's um it the the reason i was using that was because you know back when i was keto um was that from the research i had seen there uh even stevia was having you know it it wouldn't spike your blood sugar but it could still have like a 20 percent insulin spike and, uh, and all of the other sweeteners were a similar thing, even erythritol, which was the supposedly most innocuous one, um, could potentially still cause a rise in insulin. Uh, and supposedly monk fruit was the only one that both didn't affect blood sugar and didn't affect insulin. Um, and it was kind of cleaner, you know, all natural whole food source-ish. Um, so that was, that was what drove me to it. 
Um, but I mean, I still, I think all of those things are exactly the same. The, the second, mm. if, if you're a sugar addicted person or a sweets addicted person, the second something sweet passes your lips, you're done for, you know? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. So, so the, the monk fruit, so it's some sort of artificial, whatever plant sweetener, but it's not, but it's not technically sugar. Is that right? Or fructose? Yeah. Or yeah. It's a, it's a zero calorie sweetener. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Very you glad know, I'm away from all that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I work with different people and, you know, just, just to try to help them and uh, not, not even as a, as like a patient or anything. Uh, and sometimes, you know, as patients, if people want like formal consultations, but um, I've, I've noticed several people telling me that, that kicking the artificial sweeteners is, is one of the hardest things that they've had to do. And, and one of the most difficult things that they find um, that they, that they have to do. And, and some of them have still haven't done it. Um, and because they do just still struggling and, and, um, uh, that's the thing, you know, with, with, uh, you know, keto has keto and paleo and all these sorts of things, they're great ideas are going right in the, in the right direction. I totally agree with that. But then with anything, you start looking for cheats. Um, if you, if you're, if you are looking for a cheat, you, you already know you're not doing it right. Oh, this is, a, you don't need to cheat. You just, just, just do the thing and, and do it well and, and you should be fine. Um, and so like a, a cheat, you want the sweets, you want the keto cookies, you want all that sort of stuff. So you're going to use, you know, almond flour and you're going to use monk fruit or stevia, you know, it's, this is, you're not, you're not tricking anyone and you're certainly not tricking your biology and your biochemistry, and you're not going to trick millions of years of evolution. And, right. um, you know, so, you know, just, just eat what you're supposed to eat and, and, uh, you know, find your treats elsewhere you know, just have, just you know, have feeling amazing be your treat and not having, you know, uh, you know, poor performance and poor health and, and, and poor appearance. You know, I was, I was talking to some guys that, you know, they were, you know, doing keto stuff and they were basically really just close to carnivore and they had great results and they were, you know, leaning out and getting muscular and feeling really great. But then, you know, keto cookies come out and you know, this, oh, oh, I can do, oh, this is fine. This is fine. And, and they started, you know, putting on weight and, you know, the muscles started uh, sagging and, um, you know, it takes a while before you sort of see that, that, that what you're doing to yourself. And there's always, there's always the, um, you know, the out that people have, like, you know, when, when, uh, fat was first vilified in the late seventies, uh, early eighties and that whole craze, I remember when I was a kid, there, was, there were all these products that came out that were fat free. And therefore they were good for you. So it's a cheat. It's a hack. You can have this fat-free cake, Entenmann's. That's, there was a whole brand that there was fat-free coffee cake and desserts and, um, and there's candy aisles with fat-free candy in it. And, you know, I was just a kid, but I wasn't dumb. <laughs> you know, look at that. And, uh, you know, my mom, I remember she, she saw Entenmann's for the first time. She's like, oh my God, fat-free coffee cake. She, she got two of them. These things were just, it was just cake with frosting all over it. And I was looking at it. And I was like, okay, that may not have fat in it, but there is no way it's good for you, yeah. you know? And, and that's the thing. So, you know, the, these, these keto cheats or call them carnivore cheat or whatever, um, you know, yeah, they may not have carbs in them, but there is no way they are good for you. And, um, you know, so I don't, I don't know of any carnivore cheats. I don't know if people try to do that because, you know, the oh, real yeah. Thing, yeah, I tried it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When I, when I was starting, well, and that's the interesting thing too, is that, um, like, like you said, I, I, I'm wondering now just hearing you talking about this and talking about the other things I am thinking about my own experience and wondering it might have been harder for me to, to kick the artificial sweeteners than it was to kick the original sugar to begin yeah. with. Cause yeah. once I, once I was keto, like the better I felt, I was like, well, sugar makes me feel like crap. I don't, I don't want that. I'd rather just have a, a keto snack instead. But then mm -hmm. when I started experimenting with carnivore, it was so hard to not want that, that sweet and the, yeah. and that keto snack. And like I said, I even made carnivore, I made carnivore donuts that were like <laughs> all, it was like eggs and and fat and collagen. Yeah. And, uh, and then I sweetened it with like, uh, uh, with monk fruit or something like that. And, yeah. um, that's funny. And, you know, I thought I was, I was hacking, you know, my, my, my system, but mm -hmm. the real problem was just that the, the only thing that saved me from that 
was meet salt water. And yeah. once I started doing that, that's when I started finally realizing, oh, wait, now, whenever I have these little sweet things here and there, I'm starting to feel just as crappy as I did when I would have the sugar, yeah. um, and the, the, the real sugar. And, uh, and, and sometimes I, I felt even worse. I would get like really bad bloating and cramping and farting and just, you know, making my wife miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and so at a certain point, she stopped allowing me to have some of it because she's like, I don't want to deal with that. No. <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, that was how that, like it, that, that was my, my final step of realizing that, okay, when I actually just do meat, salt and water, I don't have any of those issues. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, that, that brings up a, a good point. You know, people talk about like, you know, like, you know, people take a lot of you know, protein shakes or uh, bodybuilders, whatever that like protein farts, it's a gross term, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, having any problems with that? Nope. No. I, I, I do not like, let's see, it's, um, I I've been completely years since like, I last farted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm serious. Like it's, it's probably been months. Like I, I mean, obviously I still have like regular bowel movements. I still have regular yeah. everything, but, um, but yeah, I don't like, I, I remember being very worried many times that I was going to shit myself on a deadlift <laughs> <laughs> or a squat and, and getting very close multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> and so now i don't have to worry about that yeah. thankfully. um that's funny yeah but, yeah. yeah it's it's <laughs> very nice yeah i um you know the, the thing i noticed is it's uh it's, it's, it's really the artificial sweeteners uh especially like the the sugar alcohols like sorbitol xylitol those things are disgusting and they just they just want harm to come to your body and like you know so they, they go through and it's just like it does something with your gut bacteria that makes these little bastards go into overdrive and the the, um, the swamp stench that these things cause are just, is just abhorrent and um you know i i i remember uh, my roommate in uh, medical school he got this um you know he was a uh, um you know, he was, he was, uh, you know, into lifting and things like that, but he hadn't really, really formally gone after sports and, and lifting. And so, uh, when we were, you know, we were good friends and so we would go to the gym together. And so I was getting him into like a really you know, rigorous lifting program. And so he was getting actually quite jacked. And so he started, you know, getting supplements and, um, and, uh, uh, then getting, um, he, he ended up getting this stuff. It was like the Ronnie Coleman pre-workout stuff. Right. And something that was in this thing just destroyed his guts because like within 20 minutes of, of taking that stuff, it was, I just couldn't be near the guy. It was <laughs> just the worst thing ever. And it, it just, it was immediate. And there were other things that had, you know, artificial sweeteners and this had no protein. So that's, that's that whole protein myth away. Uh, it's just, it was just, I was looking at it. It's just tons of these sugar alcohols and, and, um, oh, oh my God, they were so bad, so bad. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I've noticed as well is that it's not the protein. Um, you absorb the protein, you know, your body takes in the protein so that that's not going to cause a problem. It's the, it's the sugar alcohols that your body has no idea what to do with. And so they get to your gut bacteria and they just, oh, there's just carnage after yeah. that. Yeah. yeah um, I remember read the, uh, the, the online online reviews of the sugar-free gummy bears where yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> those, those are great i love those <laughs> oh yeah yeah so, someone just sent, sent me one of those, another one um recently actually it was uh, a guy I had on on the show phil escott it was funny and he sent me this thing this thing was like you know it was a couple chapters you yeah know? i mean it was it was it was a very involved uh you know a period of this person's life and it was very well done and, yeah uh, you know, and, and he peppered in there, he was just like, you know, he was talking about, you know, the aftermath of this. And he was talking about how, like, you know, he's never looked down and in more of a shame, fear of a broken toilet, except for this. And he was like, and he put in parentheses, and I'm someone who uh, once clogged George Clooney's toilet, 
you know, true story. Like, I, was, I was like, well, where's that story? Like, what the hell is yeah. that? It was like, oh, that's a story for another time. Where, dude? I don't know where you live. Like, I can't yeah. hear this again. Like, this is where you live now. Like, I need to hear that now. You put a link or something, you know? Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's absolutely, those are absolutely great. Yeah, because they're just violent. They are violent, you know? And, and that's one of the things too, when people go carnivore, they always say, oh, I'm just having horrible diarrhea. Almost always, they're still um, drinking coffee and using artificial sweeteners for their coffee. And both of those things are going to be bad news when it comes to the bathroom. And, um, and that's just, just, everyone knows that, you know, <laughs> like my brother used to call coffee poop juice, you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> poop juice, you know? uh, which is gross. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, you know, but that, that's the thing. And, and so uh, a lot of people, you know, find that they have, they have loose stools and it's just like, well, no, that, that, you know, you're, you're, you're still, you know, uh, you're still eating some plants and those, those, those things are going to get you. And then the few people that are just doing just meat and water, who are still having loose stools, you just pull back your fat, you know, you just have, you just yeah. eat, eat a little less fat and, uh, and that should be fine. Um, great. Well, well, Nathan, I, I, I know that it's late over there. So I, I'm conscious of your time. I don't, I don't want to monopolize your night because I know you're, you're up early. Um, is there, is, is there anything else you, you'd just like to say to, to cap it off and give people some inspiration to, uh, you know, sort of, you know, better their health and, and, uh, in any, you know, medical or fitness sort of way. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the, the, the main takeaway of, of anything from anybody listening to, to my, my story is I, I would just hope that, <clears throat> that, that you kind of get two things from it. One, um, try it. <laughs> just, just try 30 days, 60 days, whatever you can handle. Just, just try it once. The worst that can happen is, is you don't like it or that it's something you can't sustain or whatever. And then you go back to eating whatever you were eating, but it is absolutely worth it for anyone who's not been bitten by one of those weird ticks that makes you allergic to meat. <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely worth it for anyone besides those people to, to at least try. Um, and, and then two, um, trust, trusting the process. Um, because I, I can't tell you how many times I've had talks with, with Brett. Um, you know, I'm a member of the Sean Baker's site, the Rivero, Rivero health, um, used to be the meet RX. And, and I, I go to these meetings uh, a couple times a week and I can't tell you how many times I hear these amazing stories, more amazing than mine uh, from people with, you know, multiple sclerosis and, cancer and Hashimoto's and all of these things that are supposedly incurable who say, who will say like, if I had only gone 30 days or 40 days, I would still have this disease. And after 90 days, it disappeared, right. you know? So like, if you, if you trust that process and you feel the healing happening and you keep going with it, it it's never ending. You, your life just gets better every day. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, well said. And uh, yeah, I've certainly noticed that as, as well, you know, especially for the autoimmune issues, those just go away. They just go away, you know? And uh, so anyone, anyone suffering from autoimmune issues or anyone, anyone, that anyone knows suffering from autoimmune issues, you know, really do uh, encourage them to, to try this because it, it absolutely just changes everything. You know, there are a lot of famous stories like Michaela Peterson, uh, and, and, and others, but, you know, I, I've had patients and I've had, uh, you know, I've had patients of mine and I've had, um, friends as well as many, 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 many people, uh, you know, approach me, uh, online, uh, you know, just through the podcast who have had Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and they get a biopsy, they start and it's, you know, shows that they have it and then go on carnivore and a few, and, you know, three months later, they get another biopsy. It's gone. It's just gone. Yeah you know, and they're off all the medications and, uh, you know, doctors, you know, in, in traditional medicine, they're not going to tell you this, even though there are studies showing that I, you know, I did a, um, a, a video on autoimmune diseases and I went through a, a lot of the research that we had on this current research, as well as research going back to the 1800s with Dr. Salisbury. Um, you know, they don't know these things. It's just not taught. And yet a fasting mimicking diet or an elemental diet right now has been shown more efficacious for treating uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis than steroids. 
gets people out of flare-ups better than steroids, keeps them in remission longer. Um, and, uh, you know, you have people that, you know, had, had two groups, they had a, you know, a fasting mimicking diet group, you know, just ketogenic diet group, uh, kept people out of, um, uh, uh, from having a flare up for on average 51 weeks contrasted that with uh, a a carbohydrate control group that had, you know, was still eating carbohydrates. Their average, uh, remission was zero weeks. Wow. Right? This is a big difference, you know? And so, you know, this, this, it just, it just makes a massive, massive difference. And, and but they won't tell you, you know, I've, 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 I've told the story, but you know, when I was rotating through a, a general surgery rotation, you know, we had a patient that I was consulting on that, you know, the, the gastroenterologists at the hospital were saying, Oh, this patient needs, you know, we we've exhausted our, our, our medical, uh, you know, medical treatment. You know, we, we, we think that they need surgery. So sort of assessing them for that. Um, and they were just telling me like, I really don't want surgery. I really just don't because with Crohn's, you, you're just chasing your tail. You have these areas that, that just flare up. They don't go away. You can't get them settled down. And so you chop that bit out. And then another part happens. You chop that bit out and chop that bit out and chop that bit out. Bit out. You, you get into trouble very quickly, you know? Yeah. And I mean, just, just the risks of surgery alone compounding. Um, and, uh, you know, the adhesions and scar tissue in your, in your abdomen, making every single surgery successively harder and, and more complicated. And, and, and then you just eventually you're, you've cut out so much bowel that you just, you can't absorb food properly, you know, and you're screwed for the rest of your life. And they were like, I don't want to go down that path. You know, I, I, I would like to avoid this. And I was like, look, you know, there, there are studies and there's data that show that, you know, you can actually really affect this disease through diet. And I was like, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you, you have to do this. Um, and I'm not telling you that it will cure it, but this is just, here's the research, here are the resources. And I just, I just gave them lists of, of things to look up and you, know, you check it out yourself and just see what you think. And if you want to try it, do it. You can always get surgery. You know, that's not off the table. You're not, you're not banned from the club. You know, we're still friends, you know? And so, you know, if, if you try this and it works great, if it doesn't, and you want surgery, we can do surgery. You know, they, I had, I had these bastards threatened to, to like narc me into the medical board because I was saying, I was like, like, these are, these are published studies, you know, like this is evidence-based medicine and why don't you know about it? Like you are like, I don't, I don't treat this. This isn't my specialty. This is your specialty. Why the hell don't you know about it? Why haven't you been addressing this? You know, just like the neurologist who, who just never figured out that, you know, a ketogenic diet or, or, or even better a carnivore diet can help with, with, uh, you know, you know, severe intractable epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Why, why don't you do that? There, there are, there's a century of evidence published peer reviewed evidence showing this. And so it's, um, you know, it's something that people unfortunately have to take upon themselves because, you know, the doctors that know about these things are growing, but still far too few. And so, you know, it's just a matter of people getting the message out there and telling their friends and telling their family members and sharing videos like this with their friends and family to say, Hey, you know, there's something that you can do. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right, Nathan, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. We sort of, we sort of did this last, last second, got in touch and then just, and it just, uh, uh, did it. So I really appreciate that. That was, that was absolutely wonderful hearing your story. I think that would be, you know, something that's very uh, inspirational and, um, and, and encouraging for people, especially people dealing with, uh, you know, serious issues such as, such as epilepsy. So I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And I'm honored to have you have me on. So thank you again. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right. Well, we'll talk to you soon, buddy. You have a good night. Yeah.